Good morning, and welcome to, the, uh, to everyone that is here today. Welcome also to the visitors, if there is visitors here. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Amen. This morning we are gathered here again for, ch for church service, and uh, I thank everyone that has come. And this morning's uh, verse for this morning is from uh, John chapter 14, verse 6. Uh, I'll just turn to it. Uh, I do know it by memory, but... And it says there in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what that... That's one particular verse that, where it says that, and that is, a, is referring to the faith that I have, the faith that I intend to always and forever preach on, and, and, and also depend on. And this morning, my intent is to encourage you to have that very seriously in your heart and in your faith as well, that that is what you believe in. And uh, I come across this verse and this topic because of, I, I come across a, a, a writing that says, if Christianity is a man-made religion, then why would it go against all of man's desire? And then that prompted me to have a message on on religion. Uh, I want to cover the word religion a little bit today, even though after using that uh, the message in McGregor, I, uh, Cheryl said, uh, but you sm mainly spoke on faith, and, and I agree on that, that you, the topic actually is faith, but uh, many times we, uh, when we talk about our faith, we may refer to our religion or a religion that we believe in. And I want to uh, speak towards that a little bit this morning. As I was studying for that topic and looking into, into that, I was uh, constantly thinking of, of uh, James chapter 1 in the New Testament, and there, as I, before I had really sat down to study from, uh, from memory, uh, these words popped into my mind. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this. And then it says, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's what that verse says. And so I, 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 the New Testament does use the word religion, and Paul uses the word religion a number of times when he refers to the faith that he has. Before Paul was converted, his faith was the Jewish faith and the scribes and Pharisees' faith that they strongly believed in. And after his conversion, then he believed in Jesus, his, uh, his teachings. And Jesus is coming, dying and rising from the dead setting men free, including himself. And so he refers to that a, a number of times. He refers to the religion. I was zealous in it, and I was wholeheartedly involved in it. And, and that is what I want to do, uh, do, try and do this morning, is encourage you and I to uh, really deeply think about it. What do you really believe in? And and what would you say to people if they would put you on a spot? How would you explain to them what is your religion? The religion that you believe in. Where does it come from and where does it go and, and so on. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? This morning we thank you again for God that we have been able to wake up and get ready to come to church. Thank you that you give us the desire, the strength and the health to do that. And thank you that you give us a place that we can go to where we can go and gather as a faith-based church, uh, where we gather to build up our faith and where we gather to worship you and fellowship with one another and 
feed our spiritual souls. So this morning, again, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that your Holy Spirit will guide me in speaking the words and commenting on your word, and uh, that your Holy Spirit will be with each listener and uh, give the listener's souls the f- food that, uh, that they need. It needs. I pray that you will just bless us with peace this morning, comfort, and, uh, and that the holy, oh, evil spirit will not distract us, that we can have good, pure thoughts, and that we can be connected with you. Pray that you will be with the Sunday school, Sunday school teachers, be with them too. And I also pray that you will be with those that would have loved to be here this morning, but maybe couldn't for health reasons or for whatever reasons. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be near them too and help them to think back. Help them to take a time as well to be silent and uh, be in church maybe all by themselves. Help them to, uh, uh, to realize that you have always been with them and that you always will be with them and that you're there very near to them even though they may be totally alone. I pray that you will help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll sing a couple songs together. Let's take out our red hymnals and turn to page 21. How sweetly chime the Sabbath bells. Number 21. Thirty-six. my face. 
Thank you for that and those songs. And base my faith on thee alone, we, had, we were singing there in the chorus. And, uh, and that is uh, what we need to really think and really believe. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, uh, I, as, as a minister, you uh, many times are, uh, are looking for a th topic. You, you're looking for a theme to make a new message, to make a message to, to bring forward and, and to hope that it will uplift the listener. And so that is my wish and prayer for this morning as well, that it will uplift you as I share with you. So, uh, and as I had been praying and as I had been uh, thinking of a topic, I come across this reading if Christianity is a made, man-made religion, then why would it go against all of man's desire? So then uh, the next line to it is uh, another comment to that question is, I suppose it depends on what a person de person's definition of Christianity is. So, uh, it, and that's really what I want to focus on, uh, trying to help you to encourage and encourage you to know the definition of Christianity. There is, there is a number of religions in the world. There is, there is very strong religions. There is, there is a, the top, uh, top so four religions uh, there is, and they're very strong religions, and there is many, many people following those religions and and, and living by those religions. We believe, John 14, verse 6, that it says Jesus is the only way to God, and we believe that our religion is the true religion. The Christian Jesus religion is the one that will bring you to heaven and no other religion. Excuse me, that's wrong said. The religion will not bring you there. But the way it teaches of Jesus being the only way, being the only sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, in that he paid your sins and my sins on the cross, that belief is what will bring us to heaven when we truly and rightly believe in that. So it says here also in, John, in James chapter 1, Verse 26, if any among you seem to be religious, so it uses that word again, how, if any among you has a certain belief, and this belief on Jesus, of Jesus, and the book of James uh, talks quite a bit of it, that the belief has to go with also following, listening and knowing and and living by what then that belief teaches. And the belief that we, we teach and that Jesus teaches is all of the New Testament backed up with the Old Testament. The New Testament is the last word, part of God's word. The Old Testament is the first part of God's word. The Old Testament always pointed to Jesus who would come and set men free and prophesied of it. The New Testament, most of it says how God has done it and why he did it 
And, he, and it also says what God wants to do and will do. And also has a bunch of prophecies in which many of them are fulfilled and some need to be fulfilled yet to the end of the world. But in the meantime, we need to stay strong and, and stuck in that religion, in that faith, rather, in that faith that Jesus has come and set us free. So I find it sometimes challenging and sometimes interesting once you have a topic and have been studying on it and, and taught about it, and then all of a sudden it's, it's like if you, I myself, get tested. What do, you, what do you really believe in and what do you really think of? And so, so I had this t topic already. I had this, this in mind that I was going to make a, a message on, uh, on uh, the word religion. And, and, and the question here is, if it's man-made, why would it go against us? So if, it was, if you and I were, were to think of putting out a teaching and setting out a teaching forward, then we would surely make it and design it so that it would favor us, right? So it would benefit us and make us do right and feel right and go the, the, go the desire that we have. Well, it doesn't do that. This teaching, the teaching of the New Testament doesn't do that. It sets us back and tells us many times that we are going the wrong way and we are going, not going in the right direction other than when we listen to Jesus and are led by the Holy Spirit, then we are going in the right direction. But our own will and our own desire is contrary to, to it most of the time, isn't it? Many times. When you encounter a certain thing and, and, and a hard thing, a, a run-in with somebody, or, or you're asked to do something and you don't really feel like doing it, the New Testament will lots of times say, but do it anyways, especially when it is nice, when it is doing good to somebody, when it is doing something that we don't really feel like doing, and yet the Holy Spirit says, you should be doing it. You should go and see so-and-so. You should help so-and-so. Or especially when uh, you are wronged and when you have been hurt, then the New Testament teaches that we still are supposed to pray for those people. We are supposed to even bless them. And you cannot wish bad on a person with the command of blessing. A blessing is, is a favor to someone. It is a well wish. It is hoping the better for the other person, not the, the evil. And it's very hard sometimes. So it's contrary it is against your desire, your flesh's desire. But I was reminded of it even this morning as I uh, drove here. I drove to, by myself today, and, uh, and so I can't study and, and rehearse and look over my notes while, we drive, while I drive, which I usually do when Cheryl drives. And so I left earlier so I could do that, and I stopped here near Altona so I knew that I wouldn't have a flat tire before I got here. And I studied yet a little bit and, and looked over my notes and, and then I was quickly reminded of it that once you walk up here and start speaking, things can change. And things will work. That's what I have to, lots of times I have to depend on. I have to depend on that, that even though I have like only three pages of notes here, that God will direct me through those. And that's also a faith that is also something that we have to depend on. So I was challenged after I had this topic. I was challenged or simply I was just asked, so how did you come to the Lord? I was asked by a person, how did you come to the Lord? And I, and I, know, I sensed right away that this person knew what he was asking. This person knew what, how he had come to the Lord, and, and it seemingly I also could feel that he knew very well how it was supposed to be, how, to te how the scripture teaches us how to come to the Lord and, and, and to, to believe in Jesus, the full depth of Jesus. And so I, I thought of it. 
What would I, I, I had to think a little bit and then, I, and then I, I, I gave my answer and I want to share that answer with you. But first I want to say, if you and I were alone, maybe in the foyer there or outside on the parking lot, and I were to ask you, how did you come to the Lord, what would you tell me? Are you ready to tell me, uh, give me an answer? Who's going to volunteer after by 11.20 to give me an answer? Well, you maybe, maybe think I'm not serious, but if you're willing to tell me, I am serious about it. But see, there were no hands up. And that's how we lots of times are. We're not really ready to give that answer. How, like in depth, like seriously, how did you come to the Lord? How did you come to the faith in Jesus? How did you come to that you knew that you had the forgiveness of your sins and that Jesus was real and that eternity is real for you and waiting in heaven? How, do you know, how did you know that and how did that come to pass? See, I believe very sure that you know it. But how to tell me that in a little bit of an, in depth is a little bit hard. Unless you have done it before, unless you prepare yourself for it. And that's what I actually want to, my motive is for this message, is if warn you and encourage you to think about it, what would you say if someone would ask you that question? What would you say and how would you say it? Well, I... I, I have given my testimony here a long time ago, and maybe a couple of times, but to this person, I didn't give it to him the same as I gave it to you in my message, because I thought about it. How did I come to the Lord? Felt to me like was was asked a different way than how did you... How were you born again? Like, uh, like I have said in short, if you remember, I have said in short, I never prayed a long sinner's prayer. I didn't do that. I knew the Bible from in the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus from when I was very little. And so I knew a lot about God and I knew a lot of what he wanted from people and, and that he had sent Jesus. I knew the whole thing. But... Uh, but uh, I didn't follow it, and uh, I went my own ways many times. And so, uh, and the more often I share it, and the more I think about it, as I, uh, I don't know if I said it here already, but uh, my prayer when I really gave myself to Jesus was, and when Jesus came into my heart, was, I don't want to live like this any longer. That's how long of a prayer I prayed you know why I believe it was sufficient and enough? Is because I knew what I was living and what I didn't want to and shouldn't be living anymore. That's what I meant with that prayer. And I didn't know that. that uh, I, that's what I was doing really when I was laying there on the bed downstairs and prayed that short little prayer. I didn't know really that that's, that was the moment that I, I changed my life and that, and that Jesus moved in. But I do, I do, years after God revealed that to me because I was challenged and then, I, then already I was asked, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that where you were, when you were born again? Because I challenged someone, I challenged and said, you don't need to get, have a second baptism. You don't need to do that. You, you believed then already, a long time ago, you believed it, and you were baptized upon that confession of your faith, and you don't need a second baptism. And then this person, he was told that he needed to know the day that he was born again. And, and so now he challenged me. He challenged me and said, How, do you know your date? And I said, I, no, I don't know my date. I, I don't know that. I do know that it was in the fall of 1989. That I know. And that I knew the moment he asked me that. But then I thought about it. So then I already, I, now I didn't have an answer to this person that challenged me. So then I thought about it. And I was teaching Sunday school. And I wanted to, also felt led that I was supposed to teach the Sunday school children. And direct them to, to that point where they would say, I want to live for Jesus. I want Jesus to be the ruler of my life. I, I, don't want, I didn't want my Sunday school children to live a life like I had lived, knowing about Jesus, but not daring to give themselves to Jesus. 
And so because of those thoughts, all those thoughts and praying about it, because I had, didn't have the answer to this question, I believe God in his love showed me that it was there on the bed when you said, when, you, your, when your evil mind wanted, wanted to say and said, and I was angry with my mom, and I was angry for her sending me downstairs, and, and the anger of my flesh said, mom has to come and apologize to you. If anybody remembers that, then it will make, totally make sense to you. So that was my flesh that said that. But the Bible, the, the Bible knowledge that I had said, no, that's not right. Mom doesn't have to come and say sorry. And you have no, no place and you have no right to be in anger like you are. And so that's what I, when I said, I don't want to live like this any longer. I was wrong there. The Bible spoke to me. I was wrong. And I, I listened to it. And then later, God revealed to me that that is where I, my life had changed. My desire, my motive had changed. Have I made mistakes since? Definitely have made mis mistakes since. But with a totally different heart. With a totally different heart. So now, when I was asked this question, how did you come to the Lord? And, uh, and I have thought about this and known this a long time. I answered this way. When, uh, for me, it was when I realized that I believed a lie from Satan. When I realized that I believed a lie from Satan. The, the lie that I believed from Satan was that once I committed myself and my life to Jesus and sealing it with baptism, then I would close the door to fun. And I don't know if you know, if you have ever thought about it that way, but that's just how it was with me. Truly, when I think back about my life, I got baptized then when I was 21 years old, near 21 years old. But truly, when I, when I think back of my, of my life, I was ready for baptism at 16 years old because then I had more faith in God and believed God more wholeheartedly than I did at 19 years old because then I didn't have those teenage wrong years behind me. I had them ahead of me. And so, and, and when I was 14, 13 and a half, I knew in my heart, and my desire in my heart was not to live like many people were living. And, and, I, and my desire was to live the way God teaches, not partaking of a lot of things that were making you feel guilty and bad all the time. We knew, all knew, everybody really that I, that I associated then knew that that was a wrong lifestyle that we were living, but we just lived it because everybody really did it. Not everybody, but the majority of the people. And so I believed Satan, the, the lie that Satan, uh, that Satan gave me and had me believe that if I got baptized, then I cl would close the door of fun and from there on in, it would be a boring life. And I, do you believe me that that's a lie? If you have experienced the forgiveness of sins, you know it, that that is a lie. If you have experienced the forgiveness of sins, that's when life begins. Because then you're, you're rid of the guilt. Then the, the guilt, the, the trespasses are paid for, and you're set free. And then life and joy begins. See, in sin, the sin that I believed in that was fun was only lasted for those hours that we were doing them and being in them. And for, for many of you, and my, including myself, and Monday morning, we felt terrible about what had happened on Sunday. We felt terrible. Why did we feel terrible about it? Because we knew deep down here, in here, we knew it was wrong what we had done yesterday. And so it only was fun yesterday. Today it wasn't fun anymore. And so when, we, when I realized that, that that was a lie, and dared to say to God, I don't want that anymore. And uh, like said, and now I want to get baptized, and now I want to live for Jesus, and I actually took the step, and I did it. Then 
all of a sudden there was fun on this side. It wasn't boring anymore. Satan wants you to believe that it is then, then it's a, Christianity is a boring life. Living for Jesus is boring. See, not once I can think back from that day on that when I did it Jesus' way, that it was boring or that, I, that I'm sorry about it. But the sins and the wrong wage, Satan his ways, that still, I believe and I know, it was, you, feel, you feel guilty about it. You, you are guilty. You, you, you can't continue being there. That, that shows us very clearly that uh, we can't say, uh, serve Satan and God both. And that's what I was trying to do. During the week, Sunday morning, I wanted to live for God. But in certain times with different people and so on, I wanted to live for the world. I wanted to live for myself. And it doesn't work. So that's the answer that I give. I gave. I believe that lie. That is how I come to the Lord. That is how, when I realized that it was a lie that Satan had me in, and that I was actually believing it. And when I would dare to make that step and close that door, that's how I, uh, how, the answer I gave, how I come to the Lord. So after that, and, and as you know, many of you probably too, uh, the schooling and the teaching that you had, you know a lot about Jesus, about God. I did. And, uh, and so it wasn't a question, did Jesus really come? Did Jesus really die on the cross? Did he rise from the dead? That all, I, I believe that all, 100%. I never doubted it. So that I didn't have to come to believe. I had to believe that I was on the wrong track and that I could get to the right track through Jesus and with Jesus. So then, before I made that decision, even though I knew a lot of Bible because catechism memory and Probeschriften, uh, some of you know what that is, uh, verses that we learned to, how we learned to write, they, they were out of the Bible and uh, copying them, that helps you memorize scripture, and I did. I hadn't really known that when I was an adult, and when I come here and, and learned that, that that really were scripture verses that I had been copying. Later I, I, I realized that and I saw them because the verses were so familiar and mom had saved some of the schoolwork I had and I went back to it and there it was. Scripture verse, Ephesians so and so and Galatians so and so. These verses, lots of times, especially in your German Bibles in the New Testament, there's these bold verses, the darker verses. You will look at that, and if you have, if you're, if you have been schooled with the uh, schooling that I was uh, schooled with, then you, you, if you will look back, many of those bold verses we had in school, and we were copying them. They were Probeschrift, and we always said. And, and I was amazed when I started realizing that, but I had never noticed that, that that was actually Scripture. So we had Scripture here, and that Scripture makes you feel guilty when you want to live on the wrong side of the fence, so to say. When you want to live a Christian life on the broad road to the, that leads to destruction. When I realized that, that that was a, a lie from Satan, I dare to de close the door, and I don't regret that. So, the, so that is the belief, a belief system that we have. And so I studied the word religion a little bit. And, uh, and it refers to many religions, the, the topper, the upper strong religions like Islam and Hindu and Buddhism. And, and those, those are, there's thousands of people following those religions. And we, and I preach Jesus Christ, Christianity's religion. I preach it and I believe it. And I believe that's the only true religion. But here, it, it, I, I studied the word religion a little bit, and it, and, and it goes this way. A religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to, to sacred things. And so in these other, those other religions, they make things sacred too. There is also things, do's and don'ts, in those religions. You got to do this in order to go to heaven. You got to do that in order, and, and you will have a better afterlife if you do that. So many things you have to do. We have to do too. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to have faith in the forgiveness of our sins. That's a must for us to have. 
That's a must because the Bible teaches so. So it, it, it practices relative to sacred things. That is to say, things like setting apart or forbidden beliefs and practices which unite into one single faith. Religion is a faith. Religion is devotion to faith or observances. A creed, such as the Apostles' Creeds, or constitu our constitution, <coughs> as a church, we have a constitution, and in that constitution we say, it, it, I'll, I'll read it this way, our constitution says that we as a denomination believe in Jesus Christ. And God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that, that's also one thing that I kind of, I knew, but I hadn't really noticed it, that we may confuse sometimes religion with, with uh, denomination. So uh, if you don't know it and if you're not careful, then uh, you may say, if somebody asks you, so what is your belief? What do you believe in? And then, and then the person may ask, and so what is your religion? You may say, Zomerfeld Mennonite Church. That's not the right answer. Because that's only a denomination in the religion of Christianity. So I, I just noticed that as I was studying, that, and I was, as I was looking at the word religion, that religion is the, the big picture of the Christianity. And we are a, a denomination, uh, and we, are call, we call ourselves the Manitoba Zomerfeld Mennonite Church, based on the Bible. And so I want to give you a little bit of a hint. Where can you find all this information so that we believe in them? Where do you find that? As I already said, in our Constitution or also in our Catechism. And uh, in, uh, in the catechism, after the questions and answers, then there's those prayers that are very nice to, to think about and read as well and gives you a guidance. But then there's the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and so uh, the Apostles' Creed is what you and I, many of you and I also have memorized. And uh, in German, we would refer to that uh, das Apostolische Glaubensbekenntnis. What the Apostles believed in. And it says in the Catechism, the apostles themselves didn't write this up, but the people after the apostles studied them as they, as they taught us Christianity and the New Testament, and then the people said, these 12 items the apostles taught and believed in, and, and those we were taught. But we also, as a church, we say we believe in the articles of faith, that's where we base our faith on. And so our constitution kind of has taken those articles of faith then and shortened them up and made them into 18 statements that we believe in. And so I want to just say to you, if you don't know what you really, what our church and you as a member of the church stand for and say we stand for, study them a little bit, familiarize you, yourself with them. Like, read them over often, that when you're put into this position and say, and somebody asks you, what do you really believe in? That you have a little bit of an answer. Like, we believe in this. When a, when a, when a person comes and asks you a question like that, lots of times they have a motive. They want to see where you're at and how, how deep it is with you. Where, do you just loosely say, I'm a Christian and you don't really follow anything or you really don't mean it? So if you don't have a constitution, the area, the area ministerial here or your short board, they have copies of it. And, they, and, they, and if they don't have copies, they should be able to make you copies and give them out. It's not a very thick thing. So... We, we say in there, we believe that the Holy Bible is inspired and in an infallible word of God and the final authority in matters of faith, doctrine, and Christian living. Firstly, we believe in the one living and eternal God, a spiritual being, as the creator of all things. We believe in Jesus as the only begotten true Son of God who was sent to redeem us from our sins. John 14, verse 6. We believe in the Holy Spirit as sent from God to indwell our believe 
every believer and give direction in our life here on earth. Fourthly, we believe in the Holy Trinity, consisting of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one eternal being. We believe in the birth of Jesus Christ, conceived of the Holy Spirit in, in the Virgin Mary. We believe that God as a visible church has we believe that God has a visible church here on earth consisting of the body of believers in Christ Jesus. We believe that the Lord Jesus has ordered and set teachers and leaders to govern the church. We believe that the Lord Jesus instituted baptism with water upon repentance from sin and confession of faith in Jesus Christ. We believe that the Lord Jesus has instituted communion for all believers, faithful followers, as a remembrance of his suffering and death on the cross. We believe that believers in Christ need to serve one another with humility and love, as was demonstrated by Jesus himself when he washed the feet of his disciples. We believe that God instituted marriage as a union of one man, one woman, for as long as they both shall live. We believe that the church has the obligation to keep pure the body of Christ by disciplining those who have chosen to live in deliberate sin. We believe that the government are ordained of God and as such need to be respected and obeyed except where they contradict the word of God. We believe that a Christian shall speak the truth at all times and therefore shall not swear by oath, but rather affirm. We believe that as Christians we shall not take revenge against our enemy and take up arms in defense of our country. We believe that God has given man the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose between good and evil and between everlasting life in heaven and eternal punishment in hell. We believe that everyone will be resurrected from the dead on the day of judgment. We believe that on the final day of judgment, those who have chosen to accept and follow Christ will be received up into heaven, and those that have not received Jesus as their Savior will be banished into everlasting punishment in hell. So I believe they are very, very well short written, but you have, if you don't, uh, if you don't familiarize yourself with that, you will stutter. You will not be able to answer the question of what is your religion? What do you believe in? If somebody should ask you that on the street somewhere or just like that somewhere. In German we say offerhofs. Just out of the blue all of a sudden, somebody comes up and asks you, so what do you really believe in? And if you are, don't work on it and don't familiarize yourself with it, then you will do the same as I did to the person that asked me then, when you, were you born again? I hadn't given it a thought. I didn't have the answer. Then I had to pray about it and I had to think about it and then I could come back and give the answer. But sometimes when a stranger asks you, you don't know. And you don't have the opportunity to come back in a month or two and give the answer. And then that, So what will that person say then of you? Well, that person doesn't really know whether he or she is saved or how did they come to the Lord. So that's why I'm encouraging you to think about it and give it a good thought what you really believe in. And I want to base, back that up yet a little bit with, with Old Testament verses in, in, in the Bible. But in the, in the second part of the service, even though the, our service is just about over. So we have the custom to kneel two times for prayer, and at this time I want to give us the opportunity to do that. So if you're able to, please kneel with me and pray in the name of Jesus. May God bless our prayers. Amen.
Take our blue hymn books and turn to number 447. Send the light. Number 447. shine and we have to know we have to know where we stand and how and on what we stand <clears throat> a Christian denomination is a d d distinct religious body within Christianity that compre comprises all church congregations of the same kind identifiably by traits such as a name particular history organization leadership theology, doctrine, worship style, and sometimes a founder. And that's why we have the word Mennonite in our, in our name, because we believe in the, the faith that Mano Simon started out with, that we should not take up arms, we should uh, not baptize babies, uh, those type of things that, uh, that he, as, as Mano Simon, it felt that where the the church he was involved with before that did the wrong way, and so and he he wasn't just the only one. Then there was Hofer and there was Hutter and there was a number of other people 
also found that by studying the Bible and looking deep into the Bible, found that they were not following it in the right way, and then they, they started the, the Reformation. And, the, and then this come about. And so, sometimes the founder. And it is, is a secular and natural term, religion. Or the denomination is a, is a secular and natural term generally used to denote any established Christian church. So really, when, when you look at the word religion, uh, it usually in our area, it's usually referred to Christian. It's not referring to something else. And that's why sometimes we are confused about it. When somebody would, uh, and also when we are not, when it's not explained, then sometimes we would say, well, my religion is Zomerfeld Mennonite Church. And that's the, our denomination. Our religion is Christian. But in whole, as Jesus taught, not like many people are living. That's not, lots of times, not really the true religion. So I, I thought about it, and, and I, I have... Uh, I'm looking back, and I want to go back to the Old Testament now a little bit. And just for a few verses, we, let's go to Judges chapter 13. And uh, I will mainly just comment on it, but Judges chapter 13, verse 24, it says, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. So when you read the whole, the whole chapter of Judges, this is the birth of Samson. And they, uh, Samson, his mom and dad, they were, they were Israelites. They were Hebrews. So we, sometimes the Bible refers to them also as Hebrew, the Hebrew children. And that was also a religion. At that time, it was similarly to Christianity because that was the, the religion, the teachings that God had given to the children of Israel through Moses and then the judges here and Joshua and like that he had given the word whereby they should live he had given them them commands this you are supposed to do and this you're not supposed to do and the reason why you're supposed to do it that way is so it's supposed to show the other nations that you are God's people and that God blesses people and this is how we are supposed to live a decent proper life caring one for another, loving one another, and being there for one another, and not worshiping idols. The, the, worshiping and living for the true God, the God that made the heavens and earth, that made Adam and Eve, that said, this is how it's going to be, and the one that, who really takes care of everything. But when you read <clears throat> Judges here, Samson, so uh, why, I'm, why I'm going to this part of the scripture is, so Samson, his mom and dad, had a religion, so to say. They, had, they knew of a teaching, and they followed, and they lived by a teaching. That teaching was from God. And so Samson was especially born and conceived, and he was set apart from God. He was one of the, one of the people that the Bible talks about, a Nazarene from the womb of his mums. He was from, he had a purpose and he had a job from, from birth. He, had, he was appointed by God to do something and he was also told and his mom and dad were told certain things he's not supposed to do. He was not supposed to drink of the fruit of the vine. He was supposed to not touch dead animals and, and there was a number of things that he was told a Nazarene was not supposed to do or a Nazarite. In, in Judges 13, verse 5, that's where the word Nazarite is. Unto God, a Nazarite unto God from the time of the womb, he, and he shall begin to deliver the Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. If you read the, the, the book of Judges, the Israelite, they had now, Israelites had now been set free from the bondage in Egypt and had survived, many of them, or, or not survived, but they had gone through the wilderness of the 40 years and they were now in the promised land and they were supposed to keep the land pure and live a pure life before God. 
And uh, you, you find here they were not doing it. And one of the biggest commands there was they were not supposed to worship other gods. Make themselves graven images in that and serve them and pray to them and give them honor and glory. But that's exactly what the book of Judges talks about here. And Samson was supposed to... The Philistines, they were now already over the Israelites and they had the Israelites in bondage and the Israelites couldn't live a free life anymore because they had strayed from God. But here it says... And Samson was born, and he should deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So God was going to work with him to set the, children, the Israelites free again like he did with Moses, too. Not the same way, but, but he was supposed to set them free. And so as you read here then, uh, he, uh, Samson did all these things, and I hope that you are fairly familiar with it. He... he lived and grew up and he became an adult and he, he started having interest in girls and he saw the uh, non-Israelitish woman and she pleased him and she came back home and said to his mom, dad, I want to marry her. And, and his mom, dad said, but that's not our teaching. That's not the command that we have from God. You're, you're not supposed to marry. The Israelites were not supposed to marry into the heathen people, into the Philistines people. They were supposed to they peculiar people, set-apart people, especially Samson was a set-apart person. And his mom and dad begged him and did, and he did not listen. And then he, he went and he married an ungodly girl. And, and as you read these chapters then, chapter 14, not very long after, he had to, in his, his wrong belief, so to say, following the wrong things and didn't believe that mom and dad were serious and were true and, and they gave him the right advice and he didn't go to God for the right advice. And so he wanted to marry this girl and, and uh, he uh, uh, went there and, uh, and we're going to have the wedding and, uh, and all that. And, and he started showing, and he was very strong. You know, you know that. He had these seven flocks, the long hair, and it says there that he had them, and, and she asked him, where in light I strength? How come you, are you so very strong? And, and eventually he says to her, it's because I've never been shaven, and I'm, I'm a set apart from God. And so then they, he gets drunk, and, and they cut his hair, and Really, because of his disobedience, actually, his strength, I believe his strength left him and he couldn't free himself as other times. And so here he, he was bound now. He was now in bondage of the Philistines. And they came and took him and they poked his eyes out. He couldn't see his pretty girl anymore. And, uh, and they made him a, mill, a flower grinder in prison. And so he had to walk around this stone. That is how I understand what the Bible says. He had to walk around this grinding wheel and push against this big pole and just keep walking around it day after day and day after day, working for the Philistines and making flour for them, plus many other things. And then it says here, and then the Philistines, they, they felt now that they had been set free from this strong Samson, from this strong man that had killed already a lot of them, their people, which, which God said he was, he was supposed to do because he was supposed to free the, the Israelites from the Philistines, the bondage of the Philistines. And so they, now they, they were going to, and they did make a feast. The Philistines made a feast that they were going to praise their God, God, they were going to praise their God for setting them and delivering them from Samson. And you, you can read that here in, in, in uh, Judges 16. And so he, he is uh, doing this work for them and then they make this feast and it must have been a very big building because it says there was thousands of people gathered and celebrating and partying and praising and worshiping this idol that they believe had set them free from Samson. And as they were doing that, and then they called even to him and uh, to Samson and got him out of prison. And then, they, and then it says, and he was supposed to make sport. 
And it's not written what that really means, but I'm, I'm taking it to mean he, he had to come and entertain them. So it, he had to, they, they thought he was funny. And so probably, this is how I have sometimes been told, and, and it makes sense, maybe they had him walk there all by himself without a guide or something, and then they made him trip over things, and he was very clumsy and stuff, and they would just laugh at him, because this strong Samson now stumbled over stuff. And, and they were just laughing and doing and joking and, and, and having fun, and, uh, and it was absolutely not what Samson was supposed to live for and how he was supposed to live. And then it says... But Samson prayed God and, and asked God for strength. And he said, uh, said to the lad that was with him, so to say a blind guide, said, show me the pillars, the two posts where this house stands on. And the, and the, the little boy or the boy didn't really know what for, but as we know now because we read it here. He, he put both his arms against those poles and then he prayed to God and said, give me the strength one more time. And then he pushed those, that, those pillars apart and the house collapsed or that whole big building. It wasn't just a tiny little house. This church would fit into that by a long way. And it says here that he killed more people on that day of his death and a judgment came upon the Philistines. All the top leaders and all the people there died in that and so he killed more in, in that day than he t killed in his life. And so he completed his mission. But what was God's purpose for him? Was it that he was supposed to live such a hard life and experience blindness and all of that fun and jokes that they made of him? I don't think so. So he, my point is, his mom and dad had a belief. So his mom and dad had a religion that was in tune with God, but he didn't. And so let's not joke about it. Let's, when we notice and when we realize that Christianity is the right religion, then let's get into it. And not just go be, like kind of be a, a passenger. Let's get into it and get, and get along with it and into it and, and with it. So, and then when somebody asks you, so what is your religion? What do you believe in? Then tell them. This is what I believe in. I, also, I even believe in the story of Samson in the Bible. And some people, they laugh at it. They, they think the Bible is just a, another story. It is a story, but a real stuff that happened. And so <clears throat> the next one we are very familiar with is David in 1 Samuel 26. 1 Samuel 26, and I, I just feel like I need to read the verses so that you know that they are in the Bible. I, it's not that I don't believe that you don't believe that I'm preaching from the Bible, but they are, these words are in the Bible. And, and so I, to set out with, David also had a religion. He had a belief system that he lived by, and he made mistakes just like you and I do. Many times he made mistakes. But he also many times didn't make mistakes because he had one. We ha he believed in one thing. That was that God had certain things in place for him and certain ways to deal with things. And that's what he lived by. And that's why he was such a blessed person. So may I ask, and I, I, need to, I could even ask myself, so who, according to the Old Testament, who would I rather want to be? Samson or David? And I think we would all say David. Way better news of David than of Samson, right? David, but he had a belief system. And so I, I would just want to read these verses here from the Bible before, the, before I conclude your church service. 1 Samuel 26, verses 7 to 25. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay around about him. And uh, I hope that this is not the first time you're hearing this story. So Saul was, hated David. David was already anointed as king by God, but Saul fought that and didn't want David to become king. Saul wanted to stay king. And so Saul had been after David a number of times already and tried to kill him. And David had been able to dodge the, the knife that Saul threw at him. David had escaped 
the murder. Many times, and plus here now, he was on the run again from Saul. But listen to what he encountered. So he said, it said here, uh, Saul was there and Abner and the people lay around him. So this was war. Saul was, uh, w- uh, should have been protected, was so-called protected from anybody. Nobody really was able to, supp- uh, supposed to be able to come near Saul at all because he had uh, all this, these bodyguards around him, heavy-duty soldiers he had around him, but they were all asleep. They all laid around about him. And then it says in verse 8, And then said Ahashia to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him. And I'll, I'll stop here. Abishai was, so to say, David his bodyguard, closest to him. And he was with him and he said, God has given Saul into your hand now. And now you can, he's sleeping here and now is your opportunity. Now you can kill him or let me kill him. But David had a different belief system, and that's my point. Here, why I'm sharing this, David believed in something else than that. And that's what I want you to know and and, and, and hear this morning. So uh, uh, Abishai said to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. So Abishai says, he's going to be dead 100% right now, today. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch his, forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? This is what David believed, and it was right that he, he was supposed to believe it. He was not supposed to stretch his hand against God's anointed. Because King Saul was anointed by God as a king. And so David knew in his heart, and from Scripture he knew that also, from the teachings of God, that it was not right for him to take and kill Saul there in in this opportunity. As you read here, you can read here, and I I won't read the whole whole, the rest of the chapter, but as you can read here, he said, it's not right for me to do it, and it's not what I believe in, and I will not do it. His fate was that the day Saul was old enough and shouldn't be king anymore, God would have him killed or God would see to it that he would be killed in another fight or in another war or something. And as you read this chapter, you only have to read chapter 26 in 1 Samuel and you see it. And Saul, days after or months after, because as you will read here, Saul even realized that he was a sinner and that he had gone wrong against David. And said to David, you can be in peace now because you have saved me and have not killed me. Because of that, you're you're blessed and we will now live a peaceable life. But only so long and then Saul was after him again. And then Saul died on his own spear. On his own own sword, Saul died. But not by the hand of David. Not, Not even by the soldiers of David he died. He died in his own, so to say, battle as he, they were battling against David. They, he died. And so the point is here, my point here is David had a religion too. He believed in something and he followed it through and he was blessed in it. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 and then those verses following, he also had a religion. He also believed in something. And that uh, come back to the very same book as David, his belief system was in, and said, you're not supposed to eat from the meat and the wine and drink from the wine that is offered to idols, which the kings ate and which the kings drank. And, and that's what he believed in him. But he wholeheartedly believed and he said, and I will not defy, defile myself in it. And he was blessed in it. What is, is very amazing is Daniel was made a eunuch. So he was, he was a, made so that he couldn't have children, he couldn't have family. So Daniel could have had a very bitter attitude toward God and said, if that's all that my belief system is in and that's all that I believe in and this is all you want to protect me, he could have said to God, like many of us do and many people do, 
blame God for taking their wife when they were 50 years old or so, or blaming God for that accident or the child that died when they were young. Many things people blame on and are bitter to no end against God. And that's what Daniel could have been here too. But Daniel had a different belief system and said, no, God says this, even though I have to serve the king here in bondage, and even though I am here now serving King Nebuchadnezzar and these kings that have, or have us in prison, so to say, Daniel says, but I will still follow God's teaching and I will still follow what I believe in and I will walk and live through it. And then he did. And how blessed was he? Do you believe that if he had eaten from that forbidden fruit, uh, food and he had worshipped those gods that he was supposed to worship and all that, that he would ever have been able to interpret the dream Nebuchadnezzar had? In those dreams? No, he wouldn't. God would have not been with him. Would you believe he would ever have been able, been able to be in the lion's den and survive the lion's den there if, uh, if he had not cared about what he believed in? No, the lion would have eaten him alive. He had a religion. He believed in something that he knew was true. Do you know what you believe in? Do you know the answer to a question when you are asked, what do you believe in? Many times we probably don't because we don't, haven't given it thought. So we believe in something, and I really was taken back years ago when, I don't know for sure if it was Matthew or, or Jason, but that's now plus 20 years, years ago when, when, when boys turn 12 years old and they are eligible to go hunting, right? And they have to take a hunting safety course, though. And so dad or somebody has to be there when they take this hunting safety course. And I was there listening to it and, all, and took this hunting safety course with him. And then the hunting safety teacher said, but in hunting, and he, did, he as far as I know, he wasn't really religious, a Christian or so, but he said, I want you to, you young boys to know this one thing and this is one word. You have to have proper hunting ethics. And I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what the word ethic meant. And that's a habit. That's a, that's, this is how you do things and you don't waver from it. So in other words, this hunting safety teacher said, so from today on, when you want to go hunting, then you, you decide where you want to go hunting and stuff. And if it isn't your own property and you don't have permission to go hunting there, then you go and ask for permission to hunt on that land. And then you go and hunt on that land. But when the deer goes over the fence onto somebody else's property and you don't have permission there, then you let it run. Then you don't run after it and you don't shoot on somebody else's land where you have no permission. That is an ethic ethic that you need to have from today on, a belief that you need to believe in. And that's how it is with fishing. That is, it, it, that's how it is with many things in our Christian life too. We have, have, we have to have ethics, so to say. You know, and I know, many things. This a Christian shouldn't do, and this a Christian shouldn't do, and this a Christian shouldn't do. And it's not to make our, our, our life boring. It is there to protect ourselves, to be a good light, to be a witness for people, that we are God-fearing people, God-obeying people. We do certain things. We, we even can have an ethic of believing that God says we're supposed to give 10% of, of our uh, earnings, so to say, uh, tied to the church or more. And there's so many things, many other things that we could add to it that are biblically based on things that we do and should be doing and believe in and do them and we will be blessed in them. And so I hope that you're encouraged that, to, to strive for that. I want to close with verses from 1 John 5. 1 John 5, 19 to 21. And we know that we are of God. And see, that's what I've been talking about this morning, is we know. We know on what we believe in and where it comes from. It says here, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So maybe memorize those few verses. It says, this is the true God in eternal life. This is what I believe in. This is my faith. This is what I live by. Shall we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, today again, I thank you for your word. And God, if we go into your word in depth, and even as I have not even shared James, one where it says that faith by works is de- faith without works is dead, and works without faith is also dead. We have seen from the Old Testament, and we, and we, have, we can even see it from Paul, and many people that lived and taught their people and their followers or taught their listeners that this is how things should be and encourage people to do that. And so today, to, again, too, I have, and, I'm, and I, we have been encouraged. I pray that we could apply that to our life and think about what we believe in and follow through on that and give clear answers. God, I don't believe that there's anyone here that hasn't, doesn't know a lot of scripture, doesn't know Bible verses that they know they believe in, but maybe sometimes haven't thought of how they would give an answer to a question, what do they really believe in? And so would we do that, and would we be a clear witness? Would we be a light for you? And God, as we many times sing, and even as we have sang today, we have sang that we, we, we are your people. And so God, again, I pray your blessing on this service, and I pray your blessing on what we will be doing from here on in. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So again, we have the opportunity to kneel for prayer. And so if you wonder how to do this, uh, ask God to show you. And he he will reveal to you how you should answer people. If you're able, once more, kneel with me and pray in the name of Jesus. May the Lord bless our prayers. Amen. In the blue book, number 469, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, 469. Yeah.
And that is true. Let's tell people that great, grace is greater than all our sins. <clears throat> and I want to use a, a Jude 24 and 25 for the closing, or for the blessing benediction today. Now the, unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So thanks for coming to church, and God bless, and have a good summer, a great summer. <clears throat>